So uh, good afternoon. Uh, just about good afternoon from me. I'm in uh, uh, Phoenix today. Uh, this is Anto Guriardo and welcome to Monday Live. This is something we do every Monday at 3 p.m. Eastern, um, noon uh, on the West Coast. So, so uh, welcome. Um, as normal, the panelists are listed on mondaylife.org. Um, and also just a comment that views expressed here are personal, not of any company or organization. Uh, please use the, the Zoom tools uh, to chat and uh, to make comments, uh, especially today, um, just because of the, of the topic and we really want a broad discussion of, uh, of what, uh, what, what's happened uh, this year, as you were. Um, and that's all under this sort of um, theme that we selected for uh, this month, um, clarity. Um, and uh, really what we want to do is to see uh, throughout the course of this year, we've talked about lots of different subjects and really it's a discussion about that brought us any more clarity and what, what do we need to, what do we need to see, get even more clarity in the future. So let's, um, let's see how that conversation goes. Um, and that's really what we're talking about, what have we learned uh, this year. Um, and before we get to that, um, Ken, over to you. Okay, thanks, Anto. Uh, yes, so our issue is just online. Uh, happy month to everyone. Uh, creating clarity, we picked up on your theme. Uh, it sounded like such a nice, uh, nice comforting see, uh, theme, but once you actually start to, uh, to see what is it I can do to create clarity, it seemed like everything I touched got very mm -hmm. complex. And uh, I think uh, one of the problems with clarity is uh, clarity is based on uh, on on things not changing, and everything, of course, is in rapid change. And uh, uh, so, what we have to do is we have to understand the change first before we can actually even attempt to try and clarify. Uh, so it's it's a, it's a an interesting uh, goal we've created. Uh, happy to have uh, Anto's. Uh, interview on the open source stack. We believe that is a tool that we can use to simplify and clarify for presentation. Uh, Scott Cochran, who is at your convention, uh, probably getting ready for his uh, presentations. Uh, I think that's right after, you might clarify on that. Uh, I think that's after, uh, after our Monday Live. And uh, he's talking about zombies and uh, basically how we're struggling in the worst workforce to uh, there, as we're in a shortage of people in our industry and we've got people picking away, picking cherry picking our, our good folks out of the industry. So uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting times. Uh, <clears throat> along on a similar vein is uh, Melissa uh, talking about uh, her program where she's uh, uh, looking towards the apprenticeship model, a uh, very interesting article, and she's hoping to fill 30,000 uh, jobs nationwide. Read that article in uh, our, this issue. And uh, we've also, in a collaboration, we have, uh, uh, are featuring uh, BIG, the, the Building Intelligent Group, and what they're doing. Uh, we see strength in working with them, and they see strength in working with us, so that's good. Uh, my daily thoughts that basically come together to put the monthly issue together uh, assemble on uh, LinkedIn and Twitter. So it's interesting to just spin through there and see all of the things that are going on. Everything that falls off my desk ends up uh, on uh, social media. Okay, so back to you, uh, Handel. Thank you, Ken. Um, so Anno, uh, what do you have for us this week? Uh, I'm kind of just still focused on the um, what's happening in the marketplace and acquisitions and roll-ups and all this sort of thing. So if you haven't seen, if you didn't see this last week, uh, JLLT actually acquired Building Energies, uh, Building Engines. And if you know those guys, have been around for a little while um, and bought them for three hundred million dollars last week. Wow! Uh, yeah. Um, wow. Significant number. Um, um, and you know, they, uh, if you read the, if you read the article, it kind of does a really good job of describing what JLLT is going to go do with that. It's, it's part of the JLLT. So if Scott's on the call, I'm not sure if he's on there, he, he might know more about it as well. 
Um, but we're seeing a lot more of this happen. We, you know, back to some of the earlier slide decks I had over the last few weeks. There's there's a lot of M and A going on um, in the marketplace, which, as much as we're trying to create clarity, is also creating confusion. Right, what's going on? So that's me. Great, thank you. Uh, so uh, I am here at Realcom and IBCon in, in uh, Scottsdale. Um, so conference is back. This is my badge just to prove it. And uh, when I checked in, they gave me a choice of a red, a yellow, or a green sticker. And I picked the, the green one saying that I'm into uh, shaking hands and um, hugs and whatever. And you can choose different colors if you didn't want to do that. So it's kind of an interesting system. Um, and uh, Tracy is also um, here with me um, because he lives here. <laughs> and he's actually sitting, sitting right across the, the table from me. Um, so uh, before we move on, any, any other comments out, out of band to that slide from anyone? Um, I saw a, a survey, which I'll, I'll put the link on, but it was from Blue, Blue Sky, and uh, they're kind of suggesting that, you know, well, the question was, plan to install sensors in the next two months to monitor room occupancy and adjust HVAC loads. And it pretty much they're doing it by floor or building, and they're actually just saying that about a third have already ordered or installing it, um, about a third are thinking about it and about a third are not really thinking about it. So that's out of about 250 people, the building owners that, that they surveyed. So quite interesting to see that two thirds of people are kind of considering, you know, adjusting their HVAC um, from, from, you know, sensors for room occupancy and, and HVAC loads. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Roger. Any other thoughts? All right. So let's dig into clarity. Um, as uh, Ken mentioned, we kind of came up with this sort of concept of um, getting towards the end of the year. We've done a lot of uh, a lot of discussions about all sorts of different topics, and really the question is, do we have any more clarity, um, and are we making any progress? Um, so that's kind of the, the, the conversation of this week. But just to remind everybody what we've um, gone through this year. Um, in January, we talked about the future of workforce. Um, that was, um, we had a few weeks talking about that. Um, I think that this subject has obviously moved on significantly because of the, the coalition work and the workforce work uh, that Melissa is driving. So there's some progress. Uh, do we have clarity? I don't know, we have a number, 30,000 jobs, as uh, Ken, Ken mentioned earlier that uh, Melissa wrote about. So maybe some progress. Um, on In February this year, we talked about smart to autonomous buildings. Uh, do we have clarity on this? Not sure. Um, we then talked about sustainability for the whole month of March. That then led to a conversation about digital twin in April. Um, there was uh, a lot of, uh, I think, confusion back then about the, the digital twin subject. Um, so that was that. And then we talked about new market dynamics and um, quite a lot of sort of interesting um, conversation there. And I think there's a lot of progress that's been made on that front um, with um, things like the smarter stack and just trying to draw the picture and, and obviously the coalition stuff as well. Um, in June, um, we talked about smart building enablers. I to be honest, I can't remember much of that month uh, for no other reasons than I can't remember. Um, and in July, we're talking about delivering smart buildings. Um, and uh, again, that, that uh, I think that was reflected to some degree on the, on the, the smarter stack. Um, and then we talked about the smarter stack in August. Uh-oh. Did uh -oh. we lose Anto? Yeah, Anto just locked up. Oh. Not good. <clears throat> That's what happens when you use conference Wi-Fi. <laughs> Tracy, you're still there, though. Maybe. And I'm guessing Tracy's on the same Wi-Fi. No, no, we're both using our cell phones, actually. 
Oh, ah, it's just uh, switched uh, over, so. Uh, so yeah, it's just started be... again. So I guess uh, while yeah, we're waiting for so. so you could could ask the question. I mean, you guys actually seen yeah. more clarity these days? I would suggest here everybody's still hanging on um, to make a decision on what they're going to do with their buildings with the the hybrid working and not changing a whole lot. But the only people who are really considering what they're going to do are the real estate, the REITs, because they know they've got to preempt something. So they're more active than the, the occupiers at the moment. Is you seen similar things in the, the US? Or? Yeah, I, I was going to say, Roger, I just got off a, I don't know, it was a two hour call, one of our customers. And, and it was kind of fun because it was scheduled as half an hour. And I thought, well, you know, this would be easy because you know, we're all up to speed and we know what's going on. And at the end of the call, I'm like, wow, there's a lot of confusion about even, you know, the basics. And and my takeaway from it was that, I think something that Ken mentioned earlier was that there is absolutely a speed of change of what's going on in the space, right? There's a speed of change of of technologies or startup companies, new initiatives, new thinking, you know, pandemic, of course, um, sped that up tremendously. Um, and the, the, the rate of change is not something I think our industry deals well with, right? We don't deal well with rate of change of stuff. Um, 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 and so, you know, my takeaway is a, as much as you know, I try to keep up on all the changes and what's going on and where the new thinking is and all that sort of stuff. I, I, I take for granted that others are doing the same and that's not true. I think yeah. others are not keeping up with what's going on. And, and, and oftentimes I'm just the call I had and I'm always surprised by the fact that they're surprised, you know, <laughs> by what's happening and what's going on. And I'm like, why are you surprised by that? It's been going on for two years. And, um, so yeah, I think the, I don't think it's got. I don't think we've got any more clear. I don't know that's got worse, but it's definitely not got more clear. No, I, think I definitely, aware of, I definitely aware concur on that. Uh, the need to uh, change. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Sorry. No, okay. I, I think people are aware of the need for change, but they're just not sure yet. What what you know what they're going to change, especially the occupiers who are still trying to work out how they handle their staff with hybrid working and the space they need and what should, what it should look like in in the uh, in the office. So I think until that gets more clarity, um, I think you know we may be hung in there. But the the whole technical thing is still going to race on because, as you quite rightly pointed out, I know the amount of investment in startups and stuff is just huge and you know some of it's got to stick you know i mean we all know that you know a lot of them won't make it but a lot of it you know but principally some of it will stick i think the other thing is uh as i was trying to you know bring clarity to this is it's there's such radical changes i mean it's not just like little shift little things doing just slightly different uh some of the ways we do things electronically now and the way the young kids think the way they use their phones and the way we use our phones is just set so completely different. And they're so adapted to an online life, the, the folks that are born online. Uh, so we've got all of that going on. And so in all of a sudden, we're in a conversation talking about how to do something. And we have to kind of back right out of it and go back to basics. So what, what is it you guys are doing? You know, like they're doing something completely different that we haven't even imagined. So yeah, the uh, definition of the change that we are in is definitely a big part of the clarity. I, I do want to echo something that Roger said, sorry, um, too, is that I, I think I see the same, right, is the confusion of, so, of what they're trying to do. But my take this morning, or Michael this morning, for example, was again that it was based on them trying to understand what their priority is. It's almost like they've been given this smorgasbord of stuff. You know, it's like going up to the way I described to my wife, for example, this, I, I hate going to, um, what do you call it, Jason's Deli, where they have the salad bar, you know, where they have everything on the salad bar. 
whenever you give me a salad bar, I make the worst salad, man. I, <laughs> you know, I want a bit of this and a bit of that and a bit of this. And, and I think part of the challenge is that as well, right, is that there's just so much that's in front of them today trying to define what their priority is, what our customers use as priority is, what's important. You know, it's a little bit like, it's a little bit like that. Wow, I want this and I want that. And that looks really cool. And this looks really cool. And they, and they, they kind of get a little lost as a result. It was a lot easier, you know, 10 years ago when you only had two things to choose from. But the problem yeah. is, is the, 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 what it is they're doing is changing too. Are the people coming back to the building? Is the building going to be more of a hotel than an office? You know, every everything they touch is changing. It's just uh, it's just very very difficult to. I think we could spend more time defining what it is we're we're trying to do before we even attempt to try and yeah. you know how we're going to do it and whether well, yeah I can to do it. Yeah, just kind of pick up. I think there's what I'm clear about is that we're not going back to the way it was. Mm -hmm. That hybrid yeah. is 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 the new, if you will, the new norm, and but we are uncertain about how to implement that, um, and and so you've got, you know, where where particularly for the REITs where they're trying to preserve their their income, uh, and they're not sure whether they're going to get renewals, and we pretty darn certain that a lot of those tenants are going to scale back. But until those leases actually get negotiated, um, the impact isn't going to become clear just how drastic it might end up looking like. And then at that point, they're like, okay, now what do we do? Um, there, so I, I don't think enough time has gone by to really let this thing play itself out um, because, you know, every the darn pandemic is just, you know, lingered on interminably. And so people were sort of thinking they'd already be back to work and we'd see some of the dynamics playing. But because we've learned that we can do so much remotely, we're, there's no way everybody's going back to the office. It isn't happening, in my, my opinion. That's what I'm, if I'm personally clear about, it's, it's gonna be hybrid for, for, I would say the office environment. Now, you know, factories is a different thing. They've got to deal with robotics. Uh, retail has a different thing because of the pressures from online purchasing. So every segment of the market has a different issue, but where, where employees traditionally got in a car or a train or a bus and went to the office um, to do their job, those days are being reimagined, um, I think, without, without exception. And, but again, how it's going to happen is, is, is going to, is going to work, is going to be thing. But Secondly, what, how, what, whatever happens for these buildings, the way in which the buildings operate, I believe is also um, changing in, in the sense that they need to be, um, this, this movement towards ESG or environmental, social and governance, the E is real. Um, you know, I sat with a guy who works for a large company called ISS and they do ESG um, ratings for all the public companies, um, not just nationally, but internationally. And um, it's a big deal now. Uh, it's a very big deal. They, there's ratings for each of those areas. And I was trying to get him to help us understand. And he showed me some of the questions that they rate companies on as far as the E is concerned. They'll ask, for example, what, whether they have an energy management program. They'll ask, you know, do you have a building automation system? So they're getting pretty specific. Um, but I also learned that the people asking the questions really don't understand our industry well enough to ask the, all of the questions and all the right questions. But there's no, for sure, public companies and the money they're trying to attract for investment and for their stocks are now being tied directly to their ESG ratings. And I looked up, we looked up a major REIT. I won't name their name because I don't want to, you know, have a kick it out here, but somebody I know and looked at their E rating and relative to their peers, they did pretty well. Relative to an absolute, not that great, frankly. 
Okay. So, um, yeah, that's this stuff is happening. So I do think the industry is going to our industry is going to see continued growth and continued demand for our services. <coughs> the question is, um, how does that mix with the pressure everybody's feeling in terms of uh, how many people are going to work hybrid versus how many are going to be in the office every day? Uh, but I do think the companies are, are definitely going to step up and spend money to make their buildings both efficient, which has the, the benefit on the carbon side, and then they're going to make they're going to want those environments to be a lot healthier uh, from an indoor air quality perspective. I think Steve, everybody here is is busy as hell. I don't know whether they're busy doing nothing, but they're, they're busy as hell. There seems to be a lot of lot of uh, projects and work going on. But I and we've been talking a lot about I guess the office environment. But I'd like to ask. Tracy, a question because I think Tracy, you get involved a lot much more with the multi-site type applications. Are you what what changes are you seeing there from the, the multi-sites? I think the biggest thing is um, they're starting to understand and realize uh, additional use cases for some of this technology, right? Going forward. So the ability to remotely monitor what's going on you know, during the pandemic, for instance, um, when restaurants were closed down, um, our our customers were, you know, able to log in and monitor things like walk-in freezer temperatures, make sure their inventory wasn't going to spoil, and things like that. So, prior to that, I think intellectually they understood what remote visibility and connectivity meant, but I don't think they really got it um, emotionally, let's say at the, at the level they did once the pandemic started and they really had to take advantage of some of that. So I think it's, it's moving in the right direction uh, as far as we're concerned in terms of having things connected and having that access to data and information remotely. And are, they, are they monitoring much the air quality or anything? Have you seen nope. any of that stepped up? No. no, no request for indoor air quality at all yet. Wow. Interesting in a public place. Huh? Yeah. But the one that yeah, and there's small buildings typically too, right? But um, the, the problem in that industry, I think that's more of a, a lack of understanding of what to ask for. Um, they don't have facilities people that are watching these things. You know, we're typically dealing with a franchisee, not the corporate brands. Um, and then they just operate on such low margins. You know, the idea of going out and proactively going after something like this probably isn't at the top of their to-do list. Mm -hmm. well, the one that I think the, was, sorry. The, I was gonna say the, the, the layer on top of all of this is obviously cybersecurity. Um, uh, uh, at, at Realcom here, there was a pre-conference um, session on cybersecurity by the Real Estate Cybersecurity Consortium this morning. Um, and, you know, you can get pretty scared pretty easily listening to the, uh, what's happened in, in, in buildings and just the number of devices that um, the cybersecurity people don't know anything about in, in typical sort of um, uh, buildings and, and especially retail and especially mixed use, it, it can be pretty scary. And the numbers are pretty large. Um, Tracy, you were in there as well. I don't know if you... Yeah, no, it was interesting. And they had some really good real world examples of what goes wrong. And the one I thought was kind of interesting uh, earlier in the morning when uh, not only did things go wrong, but then they amplified it, right? By creating a backup of the system after they were already infected and then using that to propagate the, the <laughs> infection further, you know? And, and that one kind of hits close to home. We, we, we our company um, get hit with a ransomware uh, in January, I think it was of this year. And I was worried that exact thing is what was going to happen but fortunately our IT team was on top of it so you know, we were out for two and a half or three hours or something before we get everything back up it didn't propagate very far it did get out beyond it started with one of the employees 
desktops and you know get onto the servers, but it didn't get out to anyone else's desktops or any of that kind of stuff. So um, we were pretty fortunate that way. But I could so see there, how that there, could have gone wrong really fast. Yeah, there was a lot of there's a lot of discussion at the cybersecurity forum this morning about maturity models and sort of ways of assessing systems. Um, I think that's going to be a pretty big sort of um, area that we're all going to need to get used to. Um, yeah. So, and, and so specifically, Anto, did they bring up CMM, CMMC, the, the, this is the maturity model? They did not. I'm, I'm familiar with it. I did not. Yeah. Okay. But there was a guy from uh, a new organization, to me anyway, called Building Cybersecurity. Yeah, Building Cybersecurity. Uh, buildingcybersecurity.org. Mm -hmm. um, the guy was here. He spoke. Um, he's an ex-DOD, right. pretty senior guy, and yep. um, that's a pretty pretty interesting organization to partner mm -hmm. with. I think you all understand the problem of providing clarity to our clients when we we get in a, a situation like this, and we're all struggling just to understand ourselves what's going on. There's just so much change. And everything we touch is uh, dynamic, so uh, it's it's difficult to add clarity. It definitely requires a lot of time defining what we're doing. So that's the part that I'm concerned about, Ken. And I agree with you. You know, I, you know, as much as the time that we spend on the subjects this year, I'm like in November now, and I'm still talking to the same people I start, started speaking to at the beginning of the year, and. They're still confused. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> me too. <laughs> I I I don't think we're even close. I don't think we're scratching the surface. Well, you know, I'll I'll add to that. Um, on the JLL side, we have three hundred dedicated data scientists to within JLL, and they're all working on stuff like we're talking about and trying wow. to figure it out. 300 dedicated wow. resources so it, it's it's complex it's it's not easy it's difficult it requires a lot of knowledge and a lot of people and to bring everything together in a concise clear message i think yeah. everyone is still struggling and will continue to struggle yep well we, i just mentioned earlier before you got on scott i so see you guys bought building engines just last week or Last this last month, I guess. Um, so another yeah. whole cadre of people that you're going to bring into your into the group, right? Yes, um, that's correct. Can you can you bring some clarity to that? <laughs> <laughs> nope. Sorry, <laughs> Wasn't involved. Don't know any of the details. In fact, um, our the president of the revenue division gave us an update late on Friday and the deal has been announced, but it hasn't been officially consummated. Um, that's not going to happen until probably later this quarter. So, you know, one, once I know more, I'll, I'll certainly, and I can share, I will certainly bring the team up to date, okay. but very exciting acquisition nonetheless. So yeah, I so, don't know, and I I don't see clarity happening for some time yet. Yeah, um, I sense that, and uh, I think we were talking earlier. I think before we started the the show itself, that we're all seem to be getting very busy, and that's obviously an, an indicator of a lot more stuff and a lot more new stuff and a lot more sort of interactions. So maybe it's going to get worse before it gets better with sounds yeah but Anto, I, I guess what i was point i was trying to make earlier is i think we're i think there's clarity around the trends there's not clarity around mm. how it's, they're going to manifest okay so yes there's a there's i think it's very clear we're going to a hybrid environment i think it's clear that we have a workforce problem i think it's clear that esg is going to impact public companies in their purchases of the stuff that we sell. Um, 
And, and I think it's clear that analytics is becoming more and more important. And even though it's only been 5% of the projects in the past, it's going to become a larger percentage. Is it going to be 10, 15, 20%? I don't know. But I'm convinced analytics is, is, is becoming, is a trend that's accelerating, it is growing. Okay. So, yeah, that to me is the clarity we can have, you know, as we look back at the year. Um, but how it's going to manifest specifically, and then how we adjust our businesses accordingly, is uh, is the is very much unsettled and subject to almost daily change. So, it could be. I think those, Steve, those, are, those are great points. It could be, Steve, that the, the reason though that people are not taking this action yet is because their leases are still running, right? As a practical yeah. point of view. Right. You know, they've still got a lease on the building which they can't get out of. And even if they need less space or they want to improve the space, you know, they've, it's, it's that they've got maybe still a number of years left on the lease and uh, are just saying, what can we do? You know, we're going to sit this out or, or renegotiate. But, you know, I can only see leases getting shorter and shorter as we move forward. Mm -hmm. But I think what you said, Steve, is, is very helpful. I think you're right. The, the trends, it's actually very clear with those trends and maybe a few others that we haven't sort of brought uh, uh, discussed, but there are some very strong trends in terms of where right. things are going. So I think that's, that's very powerful and very, uh, very positive. Yeah, and that's a good us. point. It's just to build on that. I mean, you know, we, if you went, when you went through your list of stuff that we tackled this year, you know, digital twin smarter buildings i do wonder did we go too far down the weeds or you know back to steve's point you know maybe we need to step back and go what are the what are the trends what is what is what does esg mean to our group you know what does you know what does um uh, people not coming back to buildings mean to our group you know more from a rather than sort of we dove too far down into the weeds maybe a little bit and take and take more of the macro trends that Steve was talking about and, and others and say, yeah, what what because they're probably about the only real post that we can hang on to. Yeah. 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 And and I think that's really good. And you know, the part of the thinking behind talking about clarity now is that it's, it's November and we're starting to wrap up the year. I know it's still two months, it's, it's a long time. Um, but how, what, what, what do we have to start to look forward to next year and how can we, um, use, utilize this conversation Monday live to, you know, where, where, where should we point ourselves in terms of subjects and in terms of the discussions? Yeah. Well, as, as an exact, you know, we, you mentioned about cyber, the cybersecurity consortium that's out that, you know, had their meeting today, um, I think that I agree. I think that's a trend. If you know, that's one of the trends that uh, it's becoming a much more serious topic of discussion. And you know, personally, from the business that I'm uh, trying to uh, gauge in, it it motivates me to want to work hard to come up with solutions uh, for that address what I think is a trend with more building owners demanding that these systems be secured. And so it, because I think that that is a trend, it's worth the investment in products and services that can address how to secure control systems. So everybody might take a different tact, you know, tactic on how they would, would react to that trend. But if we all agree that cybersecurity is, is something that's here to become a more fundamental component of every system we put in, then we all need to look at, okay, well, how are we gonna address it? If our customer is gonna be asking us tomorrow, um, what are you doing to secure my system? Um, and if we, you know, in what way as each of us res respectively going to, um, what's the position we're gonna take, um, depending on the business you're in, uh, you, should, you should be thinking about your answer to that question. And our, our consultants and contractors think in that way too, Steve, you know, because I mean, for years we know that 
certainly projects when when new projects are started you know the consultant will take a cut and paste from whatever he did last time right. are they actually embracing the need for for cyber security in in their specifications they are starting to okay so i, I was involved uh, earlier this year and it's well, still going on with a large uh, property up in boston uh, that was uh, developed the spec uh, was developed by a consultant, one that we all know, uh, that um, included in the Division 25 a lot of requirements for cyber. Spelled it out for both the owner, for the MSI, and for the contractors, and it was pretty comprehensive. Okay, nice. but it's one of the few specifications of that type that I've seen. But there's a there's a data point at least of one major project, and it's a major project. Uh, that is going that way, um, that has gone that way, I would say, I should say. Okay. And no, there's another one I know of that's with a government agency. And again, again, they're specifying cyber uh, requirements as part of the spec. So I, I know, I know I'm involved with two right now. Anybody else seeing it in, in your, in your projects that you're doing? It, it's a yeah. constant theme that we get, you know, I, it's, I, yeah background at the at the corporate level if we're dealing with a corporate brand mm -hmm. as opposed to a franchisee right security is always a part of that conversation and it has been actually and you know i was just thinking about this listening to you guys talk uh cyber security is probably the closest thing to a killer app that we have going for us here mm -hmm. uh, in terms of some of the different things that we've talked about in the past year and a half um, and, you know, even today at Realcom here, we saw a number of kind of use cases or case studies about why that's so important. Um, but, you know, something I haven't seen, and maybe this is something we can explore until you mentioned about what do we do kind of going forward next year is to come up with some of the more critical use cases for some of the technologies that, you know, we all uh, kind of support. In, in a good example, we're already working on analytic stuff, for instance. So develop use cases for those things that give um, owners both the education and understanding of why these things are uh, important, how they go about acquiring this kind of stuff. I think a, a lot of people don't even know the questions to ask or how to do it. You know, once you get down below the kind of larger, more sophisticated owners, it drops yeah, off pretty quickly. That I agree with. The, the other thing that was scaring me listening to the cybersecurity uh, discussion was that, you know, there, there are building systems, HVAC systems, and there's IT stuff, and there's a lot of stuff that's not in either of those buckets. Um, and our, you, you, you often refer to this as IoT. Right, and lots of other sort of devices. Um, you know, one of the questions is, do we as a group, we're into smart buildings, should we care about that, uh, or should we should we focus on that? Should we should we spend some time on that, or is that somebody else's problem? And well, I'm not sure. Tell you for me, Anto, it it, uh, it is. I, I do yeah. care about all the other stuff. Yeah, yeah, for sure. There is, and, and we do too, and from another perspective, um, you know, one of our mantras with our customers is I care much about cybersecurity because I, I need to I need to be protected by the building. If I have a SaaS cloud solution and I connect into a building that has all sorts of problems, holes, you know, um, for viruses and stuff, I, I need to protect my in infrastructure as much as I'm, they're protected from, you know, inbound from, from us, right? So... It's it's bi-directional these days. I you know the number of quote unquote dirty buildings that you actually connect to. They've got so many holes and problems and stuff. I've got more issues trying to protect my cloud, you know, from back doors that come in through them. So one yeah, the, it's, it, it's a big deal. One of the presenters this morning talked about two years ago versus this year in terms of number of nodes on average. And it it was I can't remember the numbers exactly, but it went from like a few dozen to 700 or something. Yeah, it's crazy. In, it's in, crazy. Yeah, in two years' time. So, 
The other thing we're seeing is uh, insurance requirements uh, on all contracts uh, from our own uh, errors and emissions liability and in every enterprise customer contract, uh, the insurance and risk around cybersecurity has become a huge deal basically in the last six months. Hmm. Yeah, the, the, the guy from the Building Cybersecurity Organization that I put the link on the chat, um, that was a big part of his uh, presentation talking about insurance and uh, they're apparently doing some, some interesting work there that I'm going to try and uh, dig up um, uh, 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 by I'm going to try and find him and have a chat with him after this call. On the insurance point, Jim, are you actually saying that the customer has to have it or that you've got to meet the the requirements of the insurance company for the customer? I mean, I, I have to meet the insurance requirements that the customer is putting out for cybersecurity issues. Okay. And the surveys and lists are are onerous. Uh, it's uh, it's very deep, and the the requirements that the errors and emissions insurance company, my insurance company, are requiring, are very very stringent. You know, they've gone from zero to uh, you know big company IT across the board in within within a year. Okay. Again, it keeps pointing to just the rapid change that's going on in every aspect of the industry. And just understanding the change is a full-time job. And we must understand the change if we're ever to bring clarity. We should be able to see from other industries what's happening. I mean, we're not, from that perspective of the technology, you know, we're just followers, we always have done, you know, dependent upon the the microprocessors in the 70s and the development, you know, we were always behind, but, you know, we were able to actually just pick up on it. So someone, we should be able to learn from, from other industries you'd have thought um, about how to go about some of these changes. I, I don't know if you guys find the same, but the other compound problem of it is every time I meet somebody new, I, I start from scratch, right? It seems to be that there's no place that, everybody's coming to to go, okay, I'm going to learn about cyber. I'm going to learn about everything. I'm going to learn about I, I, every time I, I run into some new opportunity, I'm, I'm back at ground zero and I have to do the whole work from the bottom up. Right. Um, which doesn't help the velocity. Either. <laughs> Why do you think that is Anna? Are these companies that just have had no real experience in automation? You know, it's a good question, Steve. I, I've, and I've struggled with it over the last few months about, uh, there's, a, there's a compound thing. So oftentimes it's somebody new that I've run into in the organization that have not come from the domain and they've either come from IT or some other area and, and they've brought into the space and then I'm basically back at ground zero with them. Mm -hmm. um, um, or they're just, I don't know, and they're just not up to speed on, on you know, maybe the rate of change is greater than they've ever dealt with in the past, you know, you know, before rate of change in building automations has never really been significant, right? And even, you know, not to be unfair or anything, but even analytics, you know, uh, we had a we had a rush of new innovation in analytics like fault detections and, and you know, tools like that, you know, 10 years ago. But they pretty much plateaued as far as you know new stuff that's come along. Um, so that rate of change, but you know what we're seeing now, maybe it's just the rate of change is too much that, that most people aren't aren't used to that change and you know not put, putting the time and the effort into it, even though it's happening. It's one of the things I just find it's just I, I just seem to restart yeah. every time. Or is it that uh, a lot of the brain trust that were made these decisions and, and got educated and were allowed to travel to shows and keep up in the industry have retired, you know, yeah. And, uh, could, that, yeah, uh, could well yeah. second string coming behind that yeah. was never nurtured properly. And, uh, basically you don't have the gravitas to, to get the job done anymore. Well, what Anna was just talking about though, follows the technology adoption curve almost perfectly. Right. And it's, right. it's only the early adopters that we tend to deal with on these subjects. And when we get to the majority, 
that's that's a long ways away and there has to be some stabilization in what's going on before anyone's going to take a real interest in that or you know some kind of killer app like i was mentioning before that really puts it over the top and forces them to, to really dig into this but it's it's not surprising to see the slow rate of knowledge or education which is kind of what i think you're you're bumping into there a little bit just because of the the speed at which everything is evolving and changing. Right. right. And, and maybe a compound problem is what you guys are now having a real come, right? I mean, with the pandemic, not going to conferences meant you didn't really keep up and even the virtual stuff, you know, it was there. It still just didn't impart the ad hoc conversations that go on, you know, and maybe that was a compound problem too, right? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I learned something every week just being a part of this group, right? So in we're dead center in the middle of it. Imagine somebody who's on the outside of this looking in. Right. Where where do they even start, hardly, you know? And especially in this industry. Um, I mean a lot of a lot of companies and service providers in the industry has not grown up through the sort of the information technology route. Right. So there's a lot of people that are, let's say, more mechanical. And um, they're typically going to start from a, a very different place and have very little exposure to information technology, never mind cybersecurity. So it's uh, starting from a very low point. Right. But is, you know, that it... gap, is that gap because it's not IT and it's not mechanical, it's, it's OT. You know, it's that bit in between that people haven't been used to. You know, this stuff doesn't really connect, does it? Ah, oh, well, it does now. Okay. I, Anto and I were talking about this previously. The the um, CIO level or the IT level versus OT level. You know, it's only just recently where any organization that I know of has somebody in charge of the OT part of the business separately identified and acknowledged to be an important aspect, right? And part of the problem is where do you find the people to put into head of OT? And it's likely somebody who has been elevated through the facilities group. And most of the people who start facilities are mechanical types, um, you know, working on systems that way, not on the computer side of things, right? Or the IT side of things. You really got to find people that can cross over easily. And, you know, that that's not an obvious thing that makes this problem generational, right? Until the, the very junior people who are coming in are the ones who have always had, you know, connected OT systems. Will we ever be able to fill that top spot with somebody who has lived that kind of back to what Ken was saying about people who were bo born with phones in their hands, so to speak, are much more comfortable and see the world differently than, than we might. I think it was fascinating to hear Scott earlier saying that they've got 300 data scientists in uh, JLL. Where did they all come from? You know, well, how did they get educated or know about what they're looking for? Really, that's like the entire graduation class of 2020 who studied that subject <laughs> from every college in the U.S. <laughs> was that, was oh, that keep, U.S.? Keep in mind, uh, Tracy, we are a global organization, so. Good point. Yeah. That's actually another good point, though, is the, the globalization of everything is occurring as one of those other changes that's, that affects so when you're talking to people, when you're trying to define the thing you're trying to clarify is uh, their high, every, we agree it's all gonna be a hybrid model, but uh, whether that's a European hybrid model or American or whether it's an owner driven or whether it's a lease and uh, you know, like just this whole definition of, and our, you know, and where are they in this, uh, you know, cyber current or <clears throat> cyber currency or what do you call it, you know, Bitcoins and you know, uh, is that going to be part? Are the actual devices going to actually start doing negotiations? Just everything that we can imagine is is in change. It's just uh, it's it's really difficult to frame a conversation. I think that's the problem you talked about, uh, Anto. Is you have to keep going right back to basics because you have no idea 
what the other person knows or what they're assuming as their parameters. You're right, though, Ken. I, I just remember that last week I, I sat in on a webinar. It was called Digital Transformation of the Built Environment. And it came out of the blue, actually picked it up out of LinkedIn. It was, it was phenomenal. It was actually driven by Berkeley. And it was a Berkeley initiative and, um, and a bunch of data scientists out of Berkeley. But they also had a whole bunch of people out of uh, NUS, out of Singapore on the session as well. You know, all young folk who are doing some really cool stuff on you know, um, uh, AI, machine learning, predictive, you know, all as it was occupancy, all as it related to um, uh, the, the built environment. Um, you know, I picked up like five new names and I immediately went out to go like, dude, I need to go talk to you, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, but crazy stuff that they were, they were talking on. So, yeah, again, you know, lots going on. It's Guys, it's interesting when I think about we go back to the 80s when DDC first emerged. Um, everybody realized that because of the uh, uniqueness of the different systems that were out there, that you needed essentially a programmable environment uh, if you were going to be able to control these things. So you had to have this great flexibility. So over time, everybody came out with one type of language or another in order to program the controls. And, and we used to start, we in fact, intentionally sold against anybody who had a pre-configured controller. Say, hey, it's not gonna work for this reason and that reason, right? And now you got a generation that's come up um, to Ken's point over and over again, this new generation, they're used to downloading an app that does something and then once they have the app running, they take the information, they, they take the result, right, from that running app and decide to do something more with it. And it, from a sophisticated perspective, Anna, it's what you just described in terms of the analytics, high-end analysis is what Scott talked about with the 300 data scientists. So the, the new generation, they seem to care and are being trained in taking data and doing something with the data, not down in the weeds, we're to trying to decide how a heat pump works. So I'm almost wondering if the industry needs to make all the local decisions automatic. That you know these things have to be smart enough that you know they, they know exactly what they're plugging into, or it's a you know it's something incredibly simple uh, that tags to well it's you know it's a train this or it's a carrier that or it's a Linux whatever that's the sequence you set it and you go and because if the engineers coming out of school today don't care about that stuff and aren't being taught that stuff and don't want to learn that stuff okay maybe that's what we need to do as an industry is take that right out of their hands and and automate all that in one way or another such that the things that they are being trained in which is to take the core result, the information and do something more creative with it, more effective with it, then let's not, let's not get hung up about teaching them how to do a PID loop, doing a, doing a PID loop. Let's, let's give up on it, guys. Maybe that's what we need to get to if we're gonna get the next generation to embrace what the hell we're doing. But we, we, were, our own worst, we were our own worst enemies, Steve, where we, you know, the way I wrote my control loop was better than yours and yours yeah. was better than Anto's and, and everybody, because you go to site and nobody could tell you have to start again because nobody knew what the hell my one you was just doing did. in the first place. <laughs> right. So there was, there was part of the part of the conversation at the cybersecurity uh, this morning was about people, mm -hmm. right? People being the problem. Um, not necessarily the data scientists and people, and people that are trying to fix the problems, but people, right. just the users, yeah. And, you know, I, I think at the end, Sabine Lamb from, from Google said, take them out of the loop, take the people out of the loop and automate as much as you can. Right. Right. So bas that's basically what, what you're saying. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I think, yeah. You remember, you've, been through all those, you've been through all those steps even at school. I mean, you know, when they suddenly, they wouldn't let you take a calculator into an exam, remember, at one stage. Yeah. You know, you'd have to go use log books or something like that, you know, and you know, what, once once you could use it, then guess what? The learning actually moved faster because nobody had to 
think about how to use the logbook and everything, but just punch it in and trust the answers that came out. One of JLL's charters, Steve, what I think you're trying to describe is to get things to a deep learning state, right? So that we actually have autonomous sequence of sequence of operations running mm -hmm. in our buildings. Right. And it doesn't require, you know, to Roger's point or to Anto's point, sorry, the Google executive said, remove the people. I mean, that's ultimately, that's what we're driving to when you look at artificial intelligence and machine learning, you know, there's a computer behind the scene that's making the decision, not a human being. And they're gonna autonomously change that sequence of operations based on all of the inputs that it's receiving. We keep on touching on the AI and ML um, over the course of this past year on, on, here on Monday Live. And I'm not sure we've um, gotten, in, gotten into that subject sufficiently. Right. Because something tells me that that's part of the answer. And it, it is, and I think to make it worse, and so every time I've brought it up and talked about it with people, customers, whatever, there is huge amount of uncertainty and confusion and you know, there's absolutely no clarity as it relates to that area, right? People are, people are promising all sorts of magical things today, you know, um, and, and people are confused as to what's real, what's not, what's possible, what's not possible. It is a whole area of, of interest that, that people are very confused on. I'd like to add to that uh, confuse, confusement as uh, the whole grid, the thing we connect to and the thing we were managing and uh, to all of our buildings is also under radical change. I just posted that we've got an article on a zinc storage system, uh, a battery system for buildings. Uh, another one, uh, Peter posted a, uh, Peter DeWitt uh, posted a thing that uh, Hertz was uh, okay, was buying was basically buying 100,000 uh, Teslas uh, for their rental fleet. Uh, one starts to think about that uh, that amount of Teslas sitting in one spot overnight. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. so all of a sudden, uh, I don't know when it happened, but our business got very complicated. Uh, oh, and the other thing, just by the way, is decarbonization is occurring inside of all of that as well. So we're now shifting from coal to all electric uh, and of course solar it, is dropping. And uh, so, and like I say, everything we touch is radically changing, not just sort of changing. It's so all of a sudden you talk about, you know, the grid, which we used to be able to say, well, the power comes in at such and such and we'll buy so much of it and blah, blah, blah. But it's not that, it's not that simple anymore because now we have to de decide how green is the power. All that, I, I, everything is getting complicated. I, I, I wonder if um, the lack of clarity is because we're actually watching the sausage being made, right? Um, because I, I just bought myself a, a new Pixel 6 phone, which is wonderful and it's got a lot of AI in it. And it's kind of wonderful. I mean, I don't actually know what it's doing underneath it. I, I don't need to know, and it, the, the result is actually quite wonderful. Yeah. Right. So, um, but I never, I never went through the the the, the making and the sort of trying to figure that out. And maybe that's what we're going through in buildings. And maybe at some point that becomes a lot clearer. Well, that was the point I was making about the controllers, Anto. Is that mm -hmm. if if you don't have, if you don't if you set up for controllers, you wire it. You see, you identify basically what it does very simply um, and you walk away and it works. That's a, analogous, I think an analogy yeah. to, to the phone that you just said. Right. Yeah, yes or no, but don't forget Anto there, there was a whole bucket load of really smart engineers behind that phone who built that thing and got it to where so that you yep. as a user so now if you're talking about us from a perspective of the user or trying to make it clear, that's one thing. If you're talking about, you know, the team of people who actually built all that, well, that's a whole different yeah. ball of wax, right? Yeah, rel relatively, yes. Um, 
but the process is still uh, the, the making of something that's ultimately will be easy to use can actually be very complex when you look at it. That's this the making of the sausage kind of analogy. Yeah, my, my so, point is someone made that sausage and you know, yeah, at some point. Right. So we're, we're well well past the top of the hour. Ooh, so yeah. um uh, so, Ken, do you want to wrap this up, Mr. Sinclarity? <laughs> As the chief sausage maker. <laughs> I, I think that is part of the problem is our generation. Uh, we, all, we all built sausages, so we took all the pieces, and we're, we're kind of concerned about the pieces. But the next generation, they, all the technologies they touch, they have very little idea how that all comes together. So maybe right. they are better prepared to, uh, to move in and uh, move quickly in this space. But uh, our, our next month's challenge, bringing clarity will be a challenge, but the discussions as you saw today are great. Yeah, but thank you everybody for um, today's uh, um, discussion. I think it's great. Sorry about my technical problems earlier. Um, the video of this will be up um, tomorrow morning and um, next week we'll have some guests so it'll, it'll, we're not quite sure exactly the, the specific topics and who the guests are but uh, it should be an interesting continuation of this discussion so thank you all signing out from scottsdale bye bye all. Okay. see you again bye, -bye. bye. bye. bye.